Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I have no doubt in my mind that China will dominate the early half of the 21st century, nor I suspect is there really that much doubt in the minds of our honourable opposition speakers, based on a little internet reading and reading generally that I've done. The honourable gentleman from America himself, uh, I believe, just wrote a book called The Beijing Consensus that asserts literally in one of its titles that the Chinese model will dominate the 21st century, whether you like that model or not. Even the honourable gentleman... Yeah. <laughs> Very kind of you to publicise my book. It's a good uh, one. But that was meant to be a pro provocation. It was not an assertion or projection. Publishers like that. I, I, I shall leave it to the audience to decide. <laughs> the honourable uh, gentleman, former ambassador, is quoted, quote, once quote, was quoted as saying, China's rise is a crucial event in the 21st century. And as, have you heard, as you've heard from my uh, fellow honourable gentleman, colleague from the Lords, and we'll hear from my uh, colleague, the honourable lady, uh, to follow me, China's sheer size, its population, its energy, its work ethic, its educated and smart people, and continued moderate economic growth will ensure, I believe, that it will thrive and remain in the headlines in the decades to come. But of course, what happens when the growth eventually slows, when increasingly China is called to play a stronger role in international affairs, and when the population inevitably ages? China, I believe, will soon face that point which, uh, uh, where there will be many similar challenges to those that we faced here in Britain in the mid and early Victorian era. Indeed, there were social and environmental challenges after decades of industrialization and urbanization. I believe it's true in the 50s in London. Many people still died by falling into manholes because the fog was so atrocious here. It didn't stop Britain ruling the 19th century, how much coal it burnt. There will be, there are calls for greater involvement of the people in decision making in Britain. There were also vested interests within an establishment here uh, with abuses of power and corruption. There are in many countries. And there was a growing social media, then cheap printing presses and early photography. Then there was an economic model, in Britain's case, uh, state-sponsored mercantile capitalism, the kind that built Hong Kong and created America. And a, a, a capitalism that needed to adapt and then there was a stable, destabilizing world beyond its borders in turmoil, turmoil that was sometimes bloody and violent. Then, as now, China's development could stall and peter out. Or like Britain, it could find a way through. Britain did this through enlightened, more inclusive entrepreneurs. People like Sped and Lewis, who developed John Lewis and George Cadbury. It's still too early to say whether in, Ch in China we will have this. But I recently met a man in China who was a billionaire, dying of diabetes, who suddenly decided to give away most of his shares to his employees. And there are, I think, going to be many more who follow in his wake as they see that if they carry on, things will end up unhappily for all of China. And I don't think that's the will of most Chinese people. Britain transitioned because leaders inside and outside the country did respond to public opinion and eventually, over time, clarified and changed the law. And yes, there are demonstrations in China, but recently in Ningbo, it, I think it's very exciting, there was a demonstration about uh, environmental pollution and the officials did change their view. That is a remarkable event and I hope one that will continue more and more. And Britain did it through the development of a more vocal middle class who mobilized to solve social problems in education, health, and housing. China is now reforming and introducing laws to allow charities to exist for the first time properly. And there are many millions of Chinese who do care about the environment, who do care about social housing needs, who do care about education. And they're going to put their energy, the energy that built China to where it is today into tackling those issues.
So Britain over time uh, evolved to respond to the challenges of industrialization, but it took time. Indeed, it took us a full century from that, from that moment before we even had our own full democracy where, when women were given the vote. And even then, in other countries such as Germany, we saw the rise of some of the worst dictators. Recent experiments in the last decade in village level democracy in China reportedly found that 70% of those who did end up being elected were actually gangsters, people who had a huge amount of power over others' lives. And today in Greece, we can see worryingly that fascism is once again on the rise. The honorable gentleman who spoke so eloquently from, uh, opposite from Hong Kong, in a recent debate a few years ago at the Royal Geographic Society, he said that the future belongs to China, not India, despite the advantages the latter has in terms of democracy and Western-style governance. Good democracy takes time and money to build. Millions of Chinese still live in poverty today. Where we might get to in China may well be very different to what we would like or expect. And we'll probably will have more Chinese and Confucian features and not just conform to our expectations in the West. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, this will take time. But there are a number of elements, I believe, that will also ensure that China can have an impact beyond the early part of this century. And I'm going to just outline some now. Firstly, a development model that will reverberate around the world. China's model of focusing on people's basic needs, on building the infrastructure, the roads, the hospitals, is not a model that will just be limited to China, even when China is old. It's one that it is doing, implementing right now and investing in, in Africa, in South America, in India, every other rising uh, emerging country. China's influence, therefore, unlike other superpowers previously, won't be primarily necessarily through multinational companies, but through investing in cities and in infrastructure and thereby lifting millions of people out of poverty uh, as it did in its own uh, history recently. It's a model that we in Britain used to espouse and lost in the 20th century. But now we're educating people from all over the world who will be building these cities in the 21st century, which China is helping to fund and build. Secondly, the Chinese dream, a second generation of entrepreneurs focusing on services, building up China's consumer health and education sectors, sectors in which we in Britain have much to add to. One that needs to be more sustainable for the environment and society, unlike the dream, the American dream we've developed in the West, and which will have a wider influence in the world, not just through cheap goods, but increasingly in the fashions and trends that affect our lives. Only a few decades ago, uh, we thought from J uh, products and services from Japan and South Korea were inferior, copycat, the result of sweatshop labor. But now our teenagers read manga, and even our royalties dance Gangnam style. What will come from China, from Shanghai and Beijing and the other 500 cities being built in China and through China? Uh, new companies, solar, digital, graphical computing firms that harness Western innovation alongside Chinese engineering and markets. Eco-affordable housing, wearable technology, health food and drinks, new forms of transportation. And don't forget, most of the world's production is actually in China. So the Chinese dream is actually a global dream. Finally, there is in China's favor a healthy fear, I believe, of the alternative. And this is where your opinion really accounts. You tonight hold the key to whether this is a Chinese century or not, or one which descends and fragments into conflict and mistrust. You're not innocent bystanders tonight. What you choose tonight will show whether we can work with China or whether we prefer a fragmented world, one of indebtedness, indecision, and social breakdown. We must be mindful of the agenda of those throwing stones who do not themselves necessarily come from a neutral, unbiased perspective. As the, no, as the friend, uh, former ambassador recently wrote, there are those, for example, on the US right wing who describe China's influence as fundamentally malign. I do not think that that thesis can be sustained. Tonight, I ask you all to choose the path of peace, of development, yes, with inevitable setbacks, but one which I believe can, with our help and greater understanding, lead to sustainable prosperity in the end, not just for China, but for us all. The choice is yours.
I say, let this century belong to China, and thereby, let it belong to all of us.